Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. I have to thank Ken Quiethawk for that amazing intro. You can find him and all of his material at nativestorytellers.com, and I absolutely encourage you to check his website out. You know, history books are only one way of recording history, and the Native Americans have their stories, which are fascinating and insightful. And if you listen with a real open mind, you'll get some of the magic that's therein as well. Tonight, I have somebody very special. Um, I have Laird Scranton. He's the author of a series of books and other writings on ancient cosmology and language. And these include articles published in the University of Chicago's Anthropology News Academic Journal, Journal <clears throat> excuse me, Temple University's Encyclopedia of African Religion, and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Talk about going big. He's featured in John Anthony West's Magical Egypt documentary series and in Carmen Bolter's documentary, The Pyramid Code. He's a frequent guest on a wide range of radio and podcast interview shows, including Red Ice Radio in Europe, Art Bell's Desert at Midnight, and Coast to Coast Radio with George Norrie, and of course, now, Nightlight. He's also a frequent presenter at conferences whose focus is on ancient knowledge, and these include Walter, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, I'm sure, Cruttenden's Conference on Precision and Ancient Knowledge, the ARE's Ancient Mysteries Conference, Scotty Roberts and John Ward's Paradigm Symposium, and the Fringe New Jersey Conference, as well as James Swagger's Megalithic Odyssey Symposium in Marlborough, England. He is far-ranging. He has been all over, and he has collected material that, that is insightful and, and, for me, a new topic, a new way of, of trying to trace the, um, the origin of the cosmology of the planet, which is so exciting. So, welcome to Nightlight, Laird. I'm so glad you're here. Hey, Barbara, thank you very much for inviting me on. I've been looking forward to this all week. <laughs> it, me too. You know, you you hit on a, I mean, I've been in the metaphysical paranormal field for probably 50 years. And wow. you, you've, hit, you've hit an area that it never occurred to me. And this happens all the time. It's sort of like if I don't know about it, it's probably – history that's been there longer than I've been alive for sure but <laughs> but you you are it's such a fascinating topic trying to find the origin of the cosmology and for those of you that you know are going to the dictionary real fast cosmology is basically the philosophy of of creation right and and so you're you're looking for the origin of the cosmology of humanity right. on this planet, right? Which My is field of study is called. <laughs> it is. It is a pretty cool field. Um, 
the field is called comparative cosmology. And what that means is that I'm trying to learn more about myths and symbols and words and rituals of, of various cultures by comparing how different cultures understood the same elements. Because you find, as Carl Jung saw, you know, you find certain elements from culture to culture to culture. So the Buddhists might do things one way that the that um, they might have an idea about a symbol that it matches the symbol in ancient Egypt. And if you compare how the two understood what that symbol meant, you can start to triangulate in on what an original meaning must have been for it. And so that's that's basically the work is is trying to get down to that root meaning for each of these things. Well, and you're you're connecting them too, which is, you know, you're you're doing a different sort of putting things in a hierarchy as far as what came first, the chicken or the egg, so that right. so that you're 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 really you're you're going into areas where there is no archaeological um, physical stuff that that can be you know. Um, carbon dated and stuff like that, and you're using language to date and to kind of put things in in the order of what they've you know how it's how it's happened. And I mean, you've got seven, eight books now on you know kind of all kind of swirling around the same topic. How what what started you on this journey? Well, I was very lucky because I sort of stumbled into it. Um, my wife had read a book uh, called um, Unexplained by Jerome Clark. It's a book of where every chapter talked about some other mystery in the world that, that nobody had figured out the answer to yet. And so one of the chapters was about a little African tribe called the Dogon, a modern-day tribe, primitive tribe, who knew some things about astronomy that they shouldn't reasonably know without having access to telescopes and you know modern equipment. Like they knew that when you look up in the sky and you see the brightest star in the night sky is, is Sirius, they understood that that wasn't just one star, that there were at least two stars there. Um, and they knew the correct orbital period for the two stars. Um, they talk about distances away from, from the Earth. They have correct distances um, in their mythology. A uh, number of other things about uh, astronomy that they shouldn't have, shouldn't have known, reasonably known. So I started um, researching that tribe. I thought whatever I was going to find with them was going to be interesting. And I discovered that their culture is actually sort of an umbrella over three different ancient traditions. They have certain elements in their culture that are like ancient Egypt and other things that are like ancient Judaism and other things that are like ancient Buddhism. And I thought, wow, here's an opportunity you know, with all three of those things unexpectedly found in one site, in one locale, um, to understand how do the pieces of these different traditions fit together. And I just started following, you know, a, a trail of study towards that. But it's, the, it's uh, fascinating. You know, it's fascinating because you seem to have been, as, as far as I'm concerned, this is a new way of trying to find out where a source was. Right, and um, the trick is uh, there are a couple of things you have to do to be able to to pursue this properly and not get sort of tangled up in knots. Um, the The biggest threat to a researcher in my field is their own wishfulness. You know, uh, the the mind is wired to see patterns, and and it's pretty easy to imagine that two things relate to each other that don't really relate. They, you know, two things resemble each other, and you can imagine that oh, there must be a connection here. And to protect against that, um, I make the rule that interpretations have to begin with the, the culture. The culture has to make a flat statement of some, some kind saying, here's how we understand this symbol, what we understand it to mean, or here's how we understood this piece of this myth, or whatever, and use that as the starting point, and then compare how does that hold up with what all the other cultures are saying about that same um, that same element. And as long as you are careful to do that, then you're on, you're on firm ground for trying to get down to a bottom level of understanding about things. Yeah, but you know, so many of these these cultures they're so far apart, and you know, you do begin to wonder just how did that that trade of or that that sharing of philosophies how did that happen? I mean, you got New Zealand, you've got. Um, it's a Polynesian culture, 
and right. and then you you've got Egypt, and then you've got India. Right. I mean, yeah. and you're, we're we're going back like. I, I think you said someplace that that they seem to have the 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 Maori seem to have arrived in New Zealand around 1100 A.D. That's right, um, which is actually very recent for my studies. My yeah. studies are more more centered around 3000 B.C., which is when writing first appears. Um, the material itself actually traces back to almost 9,000, 9 or 10,000 B.C., but the problem is that it becomes increasingly more difficult when, once you are preceding written language. It becomes a lot more difficult to anchor um, interpretations. You, know, uh, you have to have a basis for, you know, for saying, here's why this thing means what it means, not because Laird Scranton says it means it, but because some authority represents that it's true. If you get uh, you know, too far in advance of written language, it becomes more and more difficult to, to do that, to claim with authority they must have thought that it meant this. And so part of the trick is in inv- inventing and discovering new ways of being able to positively tie things together. I mean, it just it's it, it's mind boggling how you have you know connected as much as you have. Um, now Sumerian language goes back to 1600 BC. Right. I think. Um, actually, uh, may, maybe uh, yeah, maybe older than that. Um, Sumerian's pretty early, um, and actually the the cuneiform that we see. Um, it wasn't the original la- written language. There was a, um, a symbolic language before that that was more glyph, glyph-based. But we've uh-huh. got ancient Chinese glyphs and we've got ancient Egyptian glyphs. I can demonstrate using certain words that the ancient Chinese hieroglyphs were formulated and used in precisely the same way that the ancient Egyptian glyphs were, even down to the meaning of particular words and how they were represented. Um, that's part of the power of of these comparison. Um, I'm building on the work of researchers in all these all these different regions. You know, I've I've, I've written about um, Western Africa and then Egypt, then India, Tibet and China, then into um, Tur- ancient Turkey. Um, also written about uh, Northern Scotland, and mm-hmm. written about uh, the Maori most recently in Polynesia. And you have researchers in each of these regions who devoted entire lifetimes to um, uncovering evidence and documenting it and writing anthropological studies and writing uh, books about you know, meaning, symbolism and things like that, about myths and language and so forth. And their hope was that someone would come along and then take all this material that they documented and do something with it. And so that's yeah. that's basically my my job is to leverage this wealth of material that's out there. But the problem is that each researcher is sort of down in his own narrow field. So, as an example, in for the Dogen who live in West Northwest Africa, sixty years worth of researchers never noticed that a particular kind of shrine that the Dogen build is a symbolic and a structural match in key ways for a Buddhist shrine called a stupa. Mm -hmm. And that both of those shrines tie to symbolic cosmologies, symbolic um, creation traditions that are pretty much a match for each other also. And nobody had ever made that connection because nobody in Africa had any sense that there could be a connection to Buddhism and nobody in in India was thinking about connections to Africa. So until you start doing these comparisons, you know, none of that, that kind of perspective doesn't turn up. And, well, you know, you've got the standing stones all over the place. You've got them in England, and you've got them here in the United States, and you've got them all over the place. And, you know, they're usually massive or, or not. I mean, in, in South Africa, they have standing stones that are, that are not quite as huge as the ones that we have in, in the England, but and nobody really knows what their purpose was and right. you know by 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 you know taking each culture and their standing stones and what they seem to have you know the meaning they seem to have put on them um there is correlation there and it makes a great deal of sense right and um part of the trick is that nothing in this ancient system of symbols only means one thing. 
It has meanings on multiple levels of understanding, uh, even down to individual words that define the traditions. They don't carry just one meaning. They carry clusters of meanings, and that's one of the tools I can use to positively connect things from culture to culture is that you have a set of concepts that um, float together no matter what the language is or no matter what the culture is. And when you find that same set of elements, you can positively say, look, at, there must be uh, a conceptual um, commonality here. This wasn't by accident that someone put these seven ran random meanings together associated with the same word. Yeah, it's just, to me, it's, 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 you know, you think of, of primitive cultures or primitive tribes or prim, primitive anything, and you immediately, most people, I don't anymore, but once I did, um, think primitive means, you know, me hunt food, me eat, me go to sleep. It, it, right. it doesn't, it, we don't give them credit for having a deep spiritual understanding of their environment. Right, that's and, right. And what what is fascinating, um, as with almost every culture that I know of, and I don't know of a lot, but here and there, um, that that the more deeply you get into the priesthood, or or the the the, I'm using priesthood as a great big global word here. Sometimes it, they aren't priests, but those who are the wise people, or however you want to call them, that the right. more deeply in, in you get in, they refer to them as as experts rather than than priests, but uh, you're right. Sometimes it's priests, sometimes it's experts, sometimes it's um, shaman. Shaman, uh, yeah. Okay, so so you get, you get all of these different levels of people who have studied something, so that they have more secrets about the universe than than the person that is planting the field and harvesting and stuff like that. So so though though they may have not had electric lights and the internet. They they certainly had a greater understanding of their um, of their source of of how they got here, and and so you've been able to dig up or to uncover a lot of the you know you you've been able to get a lot deeper than most people have um, into these different cultures because you know you're you go right into I mean my gosh you go into string theory and all sorts of stuff with these quote-unquote well, primitive I, I, cultures. Again, I, I was very lucky with the Dogon because their priests flatly say that their symbols describe how matter was formed, how, their, their, how they saw their creator God having created matter. And I didn't know a lot about the subject. I knew enough, you know, I knew about atoms and, and electrons and protons and neutrons, and I could see that mm -hmm. their descriptions and the drawings they made to support the descriptions were absolutely right. They were right on the money. They knew what an atom was, and they knew what an atom was comprised of. And in my first book, The Science of the Dogon, is basically I set side by side what the Dogons say about a subject and uh, their drawing of how they represent it with what people like Brian Greene and, and Stephen Hawking say about the same subject with their diagram. And you can see you have an intuitive match here. Um, you could, in many cases lift Hawking's paragraph right out of his book and substitute the Dogen paragraph in place for it, and um, you wouldn't change the meaning of the book. So, so I could see that, that someone in Dogen culture knew, at some point knew what they were talking about when it came to science. But I only understood the first couple of levels of top topmost levels of, of that science. And so I had to start educating myself about the, all the descending levels because the Dogen weren't just describing two stages. They were ta talking about dozens of stages of how matter forms. And so I thought, well, if they got the first, the top two levels right, what are the chances that they got all of those other levels right? And it turns out in the end, they did. They, um, that you can, st all the way down from, all the way up the scale from wa matter as waves to matter as an atom, you can, all of, they have all of these stages conceptually uh, uh, correct about how they describe them. So then the question was, how did, they, how did they figure that out? How did they know that? Well, fortunately, they're not the only ones who preserve these same sets of symbols using similar words and similar ideas. So I have all these comparative cultures to, to look at to see what did they think about um, the ideas. So the Dogen priests are flatly saying, look, 
in ancient times, somebody who understood this, these topics, not from a theoretical standpoint, but from they're not saying, here's how we think it works. They're saying, here's how it works. Someone in ancient times knew that. And the Buddhists are also flatly saying, look, someone who understood this taught this to us. This is not because our great uncle so-and-so figured it out. It's because way, way back, somebody who was was much more educated than we were explained it all to us in terms we could remember. And our job, the Dogen in particular feel that their job is to preserve that information in its original form. And I'm very lucky to have started with the Dogen because as a society, they place a priority on preserving original forms whenever they possibly can. And so some of this I get simply because the Dogen flatly tell me what a symbol means and I can work from that. But in a lot of cases, it's not that simple that there are subtle nuances of what a symbol really represents and you have to have to sort of um, evoke that by comparing what all the other cultures say about it. Now, another tool that I have that is a huge help is that it turns out that every ancient Egyptian word defines its own meaning. The symbols that are used to write the word explain to you what the word means. And all the Dogen cosmological words, or many of the Dogen cosmological words, are actually ancient Egyptian words. So studying the Dogen gave me some insights into how the Egyptian hieroglyphs work. Uh, to give you an example of what I mean, uh, there's an ancient Egyptian word for the concept of a week, like uh, um, you know, days of the week. And it's a very simple word. If I had, had perfect foreknowledge, I would have started my, my study of the Dogen language with this word. It's written with two glyphs. The first glyph is a circle with a dot in the middle of it. That represents, it's called the sun glyph. It represents the concept of a day. And the second glyph is an upside-down U shape that it was the Egyptian number 10. And so I looked at the word and, and said, well, if I was reading this symbolically, the, the word says to me 10 days. And I went and I did some research and discovered the ancient Egyptians had a 10-day week. So oh, wow. I was astounded that the word itself communicated correct knowledge to me that I didn't already know about the ancient Egyptian culture, that they had a 10-day week if I only knew enough to look at the word and figure it out. And so then I wondered, if one work, word works this way, what are the chances the other words work this way, or some other words do? It turns out they all do. And not, not only that, there are certain words that define meanings for individual glyphs. So you can actually lay out um, a list of hundreds of ancient Egyptian glyphs and what they mean based on what the ancient Egyptian words themselves tell you they mean. Now, Amazing. that word weak is significant for another reason, because if you go to ancient China and look at their written language, their first hieroglyphic language, their word for weak was written with two glyphs, a sun glyph, which was originally a circle with a dot, and their number 10, and they also had a 10-day week. So we have fundamental comparability at the level of a single word, how it was formulated, what the word meant, how it conveyed its meaning, between the Chinese hieroglyphs and the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. These, this is the same system we're looking at, or it started out at the same system. Now, date-wise, I mean, are they? Are you talking comparable time frame? Yes, we are. Um, it, the evidence in China is more difficult. They don't, in ancient Egypt, you know, you turn over a stone and you find an artifact. Yeah. You, cannot, you can't walk two feet in Egypt and not trip across something that, that gives you information about ancient Egypt. In China, it's more difficult because... A lot of the evidence in China, you know, events that happened around um, 1500 B.C. or before didn't get written down until around 300 B.C. Or at least we know about them from texts that got written down in 300 B.C. So, so there's this huge gap in time that causes all of the academics in China to argue endlessly about, well, what did they really mean? You know, they meant this or no, they meant that. I can solve a lot of those arguments because I can see it's the same system that the Egyptians were using. And with the Egyptians, we don't have that gap in time. We have a, a very complete picture of what they thought and why they thought it. Mm-hmm. And then and their so records the, are, are flawless, too. I mean, you know, I mean, the records that they kept, the, the hieroglyphs. We, that's right. They're pretty, know, pretty meticulous. 
And then yeah, yeah. we also have the advantage of in Dogen culture, we have living priests in Dogen culture who flatly tell you what a word means or what a symbol means. They're not, it's not a, an archaeologist who's guessing. Here's a, a guy who knows in Dogen culture who tells you, look, here's, here's what this meant. And you go to the Egyptian culture and you take the Dogen meaning and you apply it to the Egyptian uh, word or to the Egyptian concept, and you realize it makes perfect sense that, that the Egyptian references uphold what the Dogen are saying. So which came first? That's a very, very interesting question. There are clues you can, you can use to try to trace it. Um, it looks to me as if the Dogen were Egyptian at around 3000 B.C. Um, ah. they, the, the Dogen have um, Dogen societal um, civic traditions predict for us what we see in ancient Egypt at 3000 B.C. If the Dogen do it, chances are very good the Egyptians did it too. So I think the Dogen culture represents an earlier form than the ancient Egyptian. Uh-huh. Um, but when you when you trace ba- trace back, there are several paths of transmission from wh- of the tradition from where it starts out. It looks to me that our first evidence of it is in the Fertile Crescent region. That's in south uh, southeast uh, Turkey and uh, southwest Ir- Iran. Ir- I mean, in western Iran or Iraq, um, in the region of uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the site Gobekli Tepe the yep. megalithic site that they've uncovered recently in the 1990s in um, in Turkey. Um, that seems to be the first um, piece we have that we can point to and say, here, they were using the same symbolic system here that as I'm tracing for these other cultures. You know, they had the, the carvings on. Now, um, I'm not as, as well informed on Gobekli Tepe as I'd like to be, but aren't there several different sites um and, and the 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 main one that that is uncovered that has all of the really really good engravings on them is that the oldest one they have um on this mountainside in Turkey which isn't very far from Ararat actually they have um any number of st- uh, megalithic stone circles that they've only uncovered a few of and they can tell from you know from sonar and things like that that buried under the dirt are multiple, multiple stone circles. And they are only guessing from what they've uncovered that the ones that are buried are similar. But these, this is the first example of, of stone masonry on a megalithic scale uh, where they have making pillars and they're carving fine images of, of animals, some of them uh, low relief and some very high relief images of animals and symbols and things like that. And then after about a 1,000 years someone deliberately buried it, covered it over and effectively protected it so that it sat there for, you know, thousands and thousands of years until it was um, accidentally discovered back in the 1990s by a farmer who was trying to plow a field. (laughs) What a discovery. (laughs) (laughs) Um, how How can they date that? Because you can't date rock. No, but if they find a piece of wood under a pillar... Uh-huh. They can presume that that piece of wood dated from the same era that they pla- the pillar was placed, and so they can carbon date the piece of wood and come up with a good guesstimate of of when the stone had to be placed. Gotcha. I, I've or, seen the carvings on, on some of the stones, and they are they're amazing, and they're depicting things that that you know a normal indigenous person wouldn't know about. Right, and a lot of it is just simple pictures of animals of, of the time. Um, uh, maybe a decade ago, or almost a decade ago, my friend John Anthony West, who's who passed away recently, um, he and his colleague Robert Schock were going to visit Gobekli Tepe. Um, and I got invited to a party at, at John's house the night before they left to go to Turkey. And so I did some research um, about the carvings that were on these pillars. And I thought it, it's interesting because many of the animals that were pictured on the pillars are the same animals that are important in the Dogen cosmology. Like, um, uh, So I thought if if the lion's share of these animals are, are 
uh, cosmological in nature. Maybe the other ones are too, or maybe I'll learn something. Why did they include animals that I don't think are part of that, you know, didn't think were part of that cosmology? So I did some uh-huh. some research again. Um, we don't have written language that far back, but what I know from my studies is that the farther back in time you go, the more commonality of language we find. So I... I started with the word, the name, Gobekli Tepe. I took the word Tepe and went to a, a modern Turkish dictionary and looked up the word Tepe and found out there were 25 meanings for Tepe in the Turkish language. Then I went to the Egyptian hieroglyphic language and looked up words pronounced Tepe and discovered that at least 12 of those 25 meanings were in, documented in the ancient Egyptian dictionary with the same pronunciation. So from that hmm. I could... I could claim, or I could assert that when the ancient Egyptians were saying the word tepe, they had the same things in mind that the ancient people in Turkey must have had in mind. And so now I could use the Egyptian um, hieroglyphic dictionary to try to learn more about um, some of these things. So I looked up the the names in the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary of all the animals that were pictured on the pillars at Gobekli Tepe and discovered that those names are all homonyms. They're pronounced like important terms in the cosmology of the Dogen. So it's as if it was a kind of proto, proto writing where a person could walk up to the pillar and see the picture, a hunter gatherer would see the picture of an animal who he knew the name of. And if he spoke the name of the animal, he was also speaking the name of a concept of cosmology that he might have been instructed in when he was at that spot. So is um, I mean I, I I don't think they know exactly what Gobekli Tepe was for, but do you suppose that this was one of those areas where teaching took place? We can guess that it must have been because in that same region in that same era, we have a whole long set of civilizing skills that make their first appearance there. Our first evidence of cultivated grains is there of megalithic stonework, of metal, metallurgy, metalworking, of domesticating animals, um, of um, temple structures. You know, um, uh, there are a whole series of things that make their first appearance there. And then from that era forward, sort of migrate outward from the Gobekli Tepe region in all directions, um, towards the various classic cultures that, that we talk about. I mean, it moved in every direction. It moved across Asia into, you know, Mongolia and China and Siberia and places like that. It moved um, southward down into Palestine. It moved um, southeastward down into, into India through Iraq or through Iran, um, as far as Australia. Uh, and we can see evidence of it in other areas. I mean, I see evidence of the same tradition in on Orkney, north of Scotland, at a, by around 4,000 BC. This is like 5,000 years after the Gobekli Tepe era. What, what, what about what about South America? Because you know you've got uh, you've got um, you know huge huge um, temples and and writings and you know the the Incans and the and the Aztecs um i mean is this the same kind of philosophy is or did it not make it across the atlantic no from what i i haven't carefully studied south america yet but i can see just from um outward shows that it's the same tradition expressed um in various ways in South America, uh, maybe a little bit later era. Um, some of the sites in uh, ancient Peru and places like that date from around um, between 2600 B.C. and um, after that. Um, but it looks to me as if it's the same tradition. I can tell from language that it's probably the same tradition. There are certain um, what I call signatures to the tradition that you can judge by without knowing anything else about a culture if they do certain things you can bet that they were influenced by the same tradition. One of those is the use of the cubit as a unit of measure, that the cubit implies that someone benefited from the same body of instruction. Or circumcision is one of the symbols that um, 
that is a ready signature of the tradition. If the culture yeah, that... imagines that there is a, was a, a wheel or a chariot associated with the constellation of Orion, that's a sig- signature of the tradition. Um, I, I was fascinated with circumcision. That, that to me, for some reason, just, just surprised the hell out of me because it just... It's something that you don't think about. Um, that that is just—it's something that that that. It, it come seems. For, I mean, it just—it's—it doesn't seem like like a, a, a crude or primitive society would be even concerned with that. Right. I mean, on one level of understanding, you can think of it as you know when a a. Um, biologist goes out into the field to do studies of animals or or whatever that you know the uh, say they're working with deer and they worked with a particular set of deer very often they'll tag the deer so they can distinguish the ones they had spent time studying from the ones they hadn't uh-huh. um, circumcision a lot would allow an instructor thousands of years later to identify which groups had benefited from the instruction thousands of years before. So oh, yeah. on That's on really one tough. level, it's just it's just a simple way. If you can get them all to tag themselves when they're born, then for thousands of years we'll be able to trace what was the effect of what we did. So that that there's one level like that to it. Um, there is a cosmological level that's very important also. That um, it seems like such an odd thing for someone to think to do. That's part of the point of it is the hope from what I could see was that someone would ask the question, why in the world would anybody do this and be dedicated enough to figure out why, what would motivate someone to ever do this to trace back what the original meanings of that was and come, it ends up being an entry point into a whole symbolic system that is, is really interesting. Um, it's complicated enough that it takes an entire book to lay the foundation for what that represents. But essentially, if if you start with just circumcision, you can reproduce this entire system of of stages of creation of matter from start to finish. I think what what I found fascinating with the Mori was that they don't have the same... um, they don't have a common quote unquote religion they they don't there's no place where they worship they have the standing stones that are sacred places but but there's no um there's no you know there's no bible there's no yeah, there's the, no dogma they do have um yeah. okay originally the tradition is an oral tradition back in archaic times this is we're talking about a 12,000 year cycle basically from Gobekli Tepe to now. And in the first okay. half of that tradition, you have certain symbolism that applies. And in the second half of the tradition, that symbolism reverses. One of the easy ways to picture that, we're all familiar with the, you the idea that um, goddesses who were very ancient, midway through the tradition and cultures all over the world, suddenly they were replaced with gods. That's yeah. a symbolic reversal. That's patriarchy over matriarchy, and it's something that didn't just happen in one culture. It happens, you know, among cultures that were far distant from each other, not in any contact as far as we know, but still in the same era. Suddenly, matriarchy becomes supplanted by patriarchy. Mm-hmm. It's a reversal. Um, one way that I, a metaphor I use to try to explain why that happens. Um, people say, well, how how did they manage to communicate with each other to know that they should do this? Well, if you imagine a person taking a, a cross-country flight from Boston, say, to Los Angeles, when you get on that flight, chances are you may only know one, you may not know anybody on the flight, or at most you know one or two other people on the flight. And during the course of the the three-hour trip you may talk to a couple of people or a handful of people, but that's about it. You're not talking to everybody on the plane. And yet, by the time you land in Los Angeles, everybody on the plane knows to switch their watch three hours. Mm-hmm. It's not not because they talk to each other. It's because 
they understand how time zones work, and they realize that when they get to Los Angeles, they, the time is different. It's represented a different way than it was when they were in Boston. And that's the way the symbolism works in ancient times for me, is that there are reasons why a circle represented the earth, uh, the concept of um, materiality, or the, 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 I'd say the concept of the earth. Uh, you find structures with round bases set on the earth in, in very archaic times. Suddenly, midway through the tradition, you're having square-based bodies, you know, temples and um, structures like the square pyramids and things like that. Um, you have circles turning into squares in a number of different contexts. And you have this kind of reversal happening with many different kinds of symbolism. Things that I didn't even recognize at first as being symbolic reversals are. And they all happen about the same era, and they all happen cross-culturally all around the world for no obvious outward reason. Well, I was fascinated with the Maori term for uh, uh, Papa was feminine. Right. That's right. And there are even even reversals there. And the Maori myths, um, somebody didn't even do a very good job of, of disguising what the original reference was, that you have um, stories about, um, you know, a, a departmental god who was taken – a different departmental god who was taken as a wife by another god. So this is a hangover <laughs> from a story back back in the day when, in other cultures, the name of that departmental god was the name of a goddess in in India or in um, in in other regions. And so you sort of have a carryover of the symbolism where, where somebody sort of obligingly changed the story but didn't get all the details slipped. Well, it, you know, it, it, it really is fascinating because there's, there's a book out there someplace and it's called When Women Ruled the World and it does go way back probably before the Ice Age where where women were the leaders, women were the shamans, women were the ones that were in, you know, they, they didn't lord it over men, but they were the ones that had the power. And Right, it was somehow, a fertility uh, cult and one of the ways they maintained control was they – we're in possession of the recipe for beer. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's one of the ways that that they managed to uh, keep control. Was <laughs> they were the only ones. This is why you see, have the the image of the the witches standing around a cauldron brewing something. Um, in many cases, what they were brewing was beer. Oh my gosh! Well, they knew they they knew their way around men for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Unbelievable. But it just, you know, it, it's fascinating how, you know, the symbol for the feminine was, was the circle and the square was the male, and, and the, the, the blending of the two created a basket, which, which uh, the, basket, the basket analogy I loved. I yes, just, the, the, the basket and the whole uh, squaring the circle. Um, in ancient China, the earliest representation of the the mother goddess and the creator god, um, the figures are holding an art. Uh, she's holding a compass to measure the circularity of the heavens, and he's holding a carpenter's square to measure the squareness of the earth. Now, these are <laughs> the same symbols that survived in the Masonic tradition. The compass and the and the uh, carpenter's the square. square are traditional symbols of the Masonic tradition. Many of these uh, ancient symbols survived in one tradition or another, and that's part of how we can have a toehold into what they represented is because you can go to an article written in, say, Masonic magazines around 1900, and you'll find an article that where some, the author writes out what the Masonic understanding of the symbol is, and you can compare that to what one or another culture says it represents. Well, you know, if you've got the Egyptian and you've got um, the Chinese and, and the Buddhist, and then then the South American culture has to fold in too. I mean, it just yeah, it, it, it looks it, like it looks like it does. And um, at some point, I'll I'll have reason to move on to that. I'll ha um, my work sort of gets I sort of get led by the the nose around from culture to culture by by various references that come up. Um, most of what I read and most of the 
the resemblances that I come across fall in the category of open questions. There's something where it looks like these two things might connect with each other, but I have no way of demonstrating that they do or they don't. And so it sort of goes on this mental pile of, well, I think it might be true, but I can't prove it yet. Well, then one day, just the right piece falls into place, and a whole book's worth of those open questions resolve. And now there's my next book. Well, the, the symbols, the glyphs, um, I find fascinating how they they really, especially the Egyptian ones. I mean, you know, they, they're hard to not misread if you really understand what's going on. Right. But but you know, some of the earlier glyphs that that are represented in your book is one called the Ark, which I found fascinating. <laughs> yes. The concept of the yeah. arc is very interesting. Um, one of the unanswered questions about Gobekli Tepe is why did the people there cover over the site after a thousand years? And uh-huh. there are various researchers who have different opinions about why they might have been motivated to do that. They didn't. This they can tell it was carefully and deliberately covered over. Someone took very great care not to damage anything, and the material they used isn't the sort of material that would have just washed in or blown in by that through natural forces. Um, so they know that somebody deliberately covered it. When you go forward 5,000 years or almost 6,000 years to um, Orkney Island in northern Scotland, you also have sites that were deliberately buried over, covered over. But when they were covered over, the people who covered it left certain symbolic elements um, buried you know, on top of what they were burying and then covered that over as the final thing. And from those elements, you can realize it, it points to an Egyptian word that's pronounced ark. There is an Egyptian word ark that means to cover over. And the symbols of the word basically um, depict the stages that a modern that are gone through in a modern Hebrew temple after they read the the Torah scroll every day, they very carefully put a cover over the top of the Torah scroll and tie it and put it away into a cabinet for safekeeping. The cabinet is called the Aron HaKodesh, which they abbreviate to Ark. So you have Ark meaning to cover the thing over. By covering over the site, they're essentially saying Ark. If you understand how the language works, Covering the thing over tells us it's an ark. That they've named it, um, and the the symbols for the word to to cover over the ones that tie to that Torah scroll are saying, look, here's a ritual that we perform every day after the the educational portion of the Torah that we read is finished. When it's finished properly, the last thing we do is we cover it over and we put it away in an ark. So by covering over the site, what they're saying to us symbolically is there was an instructional purpose to this site, and that purpose was brought to a proper completion before we covered it over. We wouldn't have, wouldn't have done the ritual to cover it over if it hadn't been. You know, I still go back to, you know, we spoke earlier, and I was suggesting that Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of, um, you know, the Pharaoh, Right. It, it it in in many ways, you know, the Templars were in search of the Ark of the Covenant, which would right. be the the source of creation. What if the Ark was the fact that it was covered over until another time? Right, and meanings of the word Ark get into <coughs> excuse me get into lead us into some of the foundational information I was talking about that is book length that that comes out of, it relates to circumcision and it relates to um, other concepts of creation where as you pursue these meanings of these words and you see how the Egyptian words are are formulated, what they were trying to say with the word, you understand that slowly over time a perspective gets shifted and what was originally meant to be one thing is interpreted in a later era as being something other than what it really originally was. Um, it's also confusing because you have these clusters of meanings, not just a single meaning. And so very often when they would write their ancient texts, um, it looks as if someone deliberately substituted the homonym, not the word. Um, 
so that if in English you wanted to say, you know, you wanted to say C S E E, but you wrote C S E A, you would make it difficult, very difficult for someone, a translator, to figure out what you were talking about. It would sound like nonsense. But when you read it aloud, it sounds the way it's supposed to sound. If you just listen to it read aloud, you get the meaning of what they intended. But if you try to read it from the, the letters, you don't. I, I, I just have the strangest feeling, and it's just me, and I have no proof. Um, I just have a feeling that Christianity and its, its search for the Ark of the Covenant is looking for a thing, and it's really a place, and right. and it may not be in physical reality. It may be a place inside of ourselves, so that so that again, the term has been over time. It, it means something different than it than it meant originally, and right. that it, something got lost in the translation. I mean, heck, it's what five six thousand years. That's possible. Right. Sure. I mean. Um, and that's why a culture like the Dogon is so very helpful because they're doing everything they can to keep to prevent things from changing. They're trying to preserve. It's like they took a sh- snapshot of how things looked at 3000 BC and said, "From now on, we're not going to let let it change. We're going to hold it in place." How did they get so smart? I mean, seriously, that's you know. Most, well, most... it looks to me like there were at least two eras of instruction, one at 9,000 B.C. and one at around 3,200 B.C. Uh, the 3,200 B.C. was on Orkney. And um, there's reason to think that the black Africans were the ones who had done the best job of preserving what you know, the details of the original instruction from 9,000 B.C. And so they were sort of adopted as... Um, like professors' aides or assistant professors or graduate student professors, you know, for the second round of instruction, they were brought in as the the immediate teachers to the initiates they were they were trying to teach, and that looks what looks to me why the the Dogen and other groups related to the Dogen are so well versed in this stuff that a lot of other cultures forgot. Well, let's let's go to Orkney because um, Orkney has a fascination for me too. Um, because of the, the structures that were there, because it apparently was very similar to a university. Right. And um, I had no background in um, in the British Isles in terms of, of these studies. I had received a question from, by email from someone I didn't know, someone in Australia, who wanted to know if I thought, he said, um, there was a little farming village in northern Scotland called Scarabray. Scarabray. Um, uh-huh. in, the, in Neolithic times, this is around 3200 BC, and he wanted to. No one seems to understand where these people came from or what they were doing there. Um, and there are there aren't aren't even really any coherent theories as to where they came from because what they see there doesn't really tie to any place in Scandinavia or Europe or anywhere nearby that would say where they came from. So he wanted to know if I thought there could be ancient Egyptian influences there. And I've learned over the years that when a question like that comes to me in a particular way from someone, that it's important that I follow up on the question, that very often that will turn into things that help me. And uh-huh. so my my initial reaction was, no, there couldn't possibly be, it couldn't possibly be Egyptian um, influences there are not likely because ancient Egypt didn't even cohese in Egypt until after 3000 BC. So we're at least a couple of hundred years ahead of when any researcher would think that anyone from ancient Egypt could have mounted an expedition to Scotland and done things. Um, now, when you get to Orkney, the evidence there is very sparse compared to what you see in Egypt. There is almost nothing to go on. There's only a handful of artifacts. You have this cluster of eight chambered houses, stone houses, that were built as this first farming village. And in their spare time, they were erecting megalithic stone structures, the first ones in the United Kingdom, a whole series of them that were connected by a road to the farming village. So we know they were all related 
in Neolithic times because they were all linked by the deliberate, deliberately linked by this road. So I had nothing to go on. I had nothing to work from because there's no evidence to work from. What was what was I going to do to try to link things in my normal way of linking things? So what I finally grasped at as a straw, it turns out that I, l- I learned from a children's book about Scarabray that all of the original houses there were built to the same architectural plan. And the guy who wrote the children's book, who doesn't live very far from where I live in, in upstate New York, now an elderly man, he had taken the time to include a drawing of what that architectural plan looked like. So grasping at straws, okay, I knew that it looked to me as if the Dogen had been Egyptian at 3000 BC, and I know the Dogen had been careful to preserve th- traditions in their culture. So if there had been Egyptian influences on Orkney at 3200 BC, I might see connections to the modern Dogen. So I did some research. The Dogen live in the desert in Mali, in northwest, the hump of northwest Africa, and they mostly build their houses out of mud because that's the material uh-huh. they have to use. But sometimes they do build a house out of stone, and when they build a house out of stone, I mean, the, the Orkney Scarabray houses are are what are called drywall stone structures. They are taking flat stones and stacking them up without any mortar and creating a structure out of them. Turns out uh-huh. that when the Dogen build from stone, they build in that same way. Not only that, they build to the same architectural plan that the Scarabray houses were built to. Now, the researchers on Orkney were saying, we we have no connection to this architectural plan. We don't know where it comes from. We can't find any correlation to it. It had a, a particular feature they called unique. It's a round room on one end. Um, they referred to it as a beehive cell-shaped room. So the door... The Dogen also have that beehive-shaped cell room in their architectural plan. Uh, the way the plan is laid out, um, there's a square central room. There's a round room at one end. There are two long rectangular rooms on the sides, and there's a re- rectangular entryway at the bottom. The Dogen have the same basic plan, but the Dogen are saying, the reason we build our houses this way is because there's symbolism to it. It's cosmological symbolism. It represents something. It represents uh-huh. the body of a sleeping woman or a sleeping goddess. The round room is her head. The side rooms are her arms. The body cavity is her chest. And the entryway are her sexual parts. Uh-huh. Now, on Orkney, in the middle of the main chamber of the house, there's a square hearth that represents the heart. And I thought it's very interesting because the Dogen, I know, living in um, Africa, they don't need a hearth inside the house. It's very interesting from my perspective that when I was thinking the Dogen plan was the original form, that when it was implemented on Orkney, that someone added the hearth in proper keeping with the symbolism of the house. They put the hearth where the heart should be. It wasn't until much later in my studies that I figured out I had it backwards that the Orkney plan was original, and all the Dogen did was when they moved to a warmer climate, they took the hearth out of the center of the the house and <laughs> moved it into their courtyard. Now, if if indeed Orkney was a, a place of scarabre, it was, was a place of instruction. teaching, instruction. There's, there's, would, there are easy ways to agri- know that. Okay. Would, would, right? Yeah. Would, yes. Would, agriculture would also be a part of that. They were okay. this farming village. Um, okay. In the ancient tradition, civilizing skills go hand in hand with cosmology. The two systems were were intertwined. That um, the symbols that are used to represent the scientific um, concepts are taken from the everyday environment of the person who they're teaching. So huh. that when I, the idea being that when the guy walked out of his hut, the things he would see in his daily life would all remind him of the instruction of what he was taught. So the way that you weave a cloth or the way that you plow a field, the animals that you see in your daily environment, each one of them has meaning in this system. And so 
Um, it's a self-reinforcing system that way. So, yes, agriculture always goes hand-in-hand hand with the cosmology, and on Orkney that would be true because the perp- you know, two things were happening on Orkney were this megalithic uh, construction hand-in-hand hand with agriculture. Well, here's another cute aha uh-huh. coincidence, okay? And I don't okay. believe in coincidences. <laughs> um, in Scotland, there is a, a village called Moray, M-O-R-A-Y. Are you familiar with it? Uh-huh. I know the name. I don't haven't studied it, but I know it's there. Okay. Well, in Moray, there is a um, uh, ooh, a, a community called Fintorn. And okay. Fintorn is a place where um, they work with the earth spirits uh-huh. and they grow the most incredible vegetables and plants. It's almost like magic. Uh-huh. And, and um, it's, it's, it's a place where, um, quote, unquote, the little people still work with humans to, to create um, the most amazing plants you've ever seen. I mean, they're huge. They just they, they grow out of proportion to what the normal gardener could expect. Are, are you familiar with a researcher by the name of Claude Swenson? He passed away a few years ago. But he did a lot, spent a lot of time studying sites in England, including Stonehenge. And his opinion was that part of what was happening there was that the electromagnetism from the, that the stones were evoking had a generative effect on seeds. And that uh-huh. people would come there once a year and bring their seed, the seeds they were going to plant to Stonehenge to leave them there long enough to benefit from the electromagnetism and then take them back and plant them, and they would have a better crop because of it. I'm wondering how close Orkney is to, I mean, the name of the town village is Moray, which to me is kind of cool. Right. I'll have to to look look that up when we're done uh, uh, with this interview, and I'll see what I can find out. If I come up with anything interesting, I'll I'll send it to you. Oh, that that would be really cool because um, it it's you know there there's there's so many things that that currently are coming into um, into public purview, and it's almost like you know unfortunately I I, I got to pull spiritual stuff here because it feels to me that the consciousness of humanity is at a place in time where it's willing to embrace a lot of material that at one time they would have poo-pooed and said, you know, no, can't possibly be. I mean, the the, the other part that you haven't, you know, mentioned yet, and I want you to, is, <laughs> is you know, that we had the tall the tall um, African people, but, but there were also other teachers there at this particular place, it is said. Yes, the first, first report, okay, uh, we start with the Dogen. The Dogen say that in ancient times they received instruction from their teachers who they called the Numa. Uh-huh. These were quasi-mythical teachers um, comparable to how the Buddhists say that knowledge was first passed to humanity by a Buddha in ancient times. Um, the Dogen say that, okay, you may remember the story from the Old Testament of uh, Moses on the mountain um, mm-hmm. and the Israelites being cautioned not to approach too close to the mountain because there were bad effects that could accrue to them if they got too close. Mm-hmm. There are, are uh, very careful cautions, if you read it, especially in the, uh, from the, the Torah portion that talks about that. The, uh, the Israelites are repeatedly warned, don't go too close because it's not safe. Well, the Dogen say that they're teachers, these mythical teachers, were originally non-material, not off-planet or anything. These were, were this, they represented a non-material consciousness that was able to act in a, take action in a material frame. But, those teachers were concerned about what the bad effect of their present was, presence was going to have on the students they were teaching. And so, their solution to that problem was to sequester eight tribespeople in a remote location, give instruction to those eight tribespeople, and send them back to where they came from to teach everybody else. Now, that's the 
archetypical pattern we see all over the world, reported culture to culture in the Americas, in China, in uh, all, all over the world, literally Asia, everywhere. Um, I mean, Australia, elsewhere, of the the archetype of the eight mythical ancestors who bring civilizing skills, civilizing knowledge with them. Um, the Dogen say that was a deliberate pattern. And um, so the earliest uh, Scandinavian sagas, the first uh, Vikings who, um, who uh, encountered Orkney, reported finding two groups living side by side on Orkney. One were small statured people of very odd habits who they <laughs> compared to wizards. And the others were average sized people who always wore white, who they described as clerics, and who were said to be so different from the Scandinavians as to constitute a different race rather than just a different profession. Oh. So in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, the word that corresponds to the Dogen term numo is pre- in, in Egypt, they aren't certain how words were pronounced. They aren't sure, certain what the vowel sounds were, so they've just taken a guess. The Egyptian word is guessed to be nema, not numo, but it means pygmy, and it even has a drawing with the final glyph of the word is a drawing of a little pygmy. It's a small statured person. Now, all around the world, any discussion of ancient pygmies, ancient small statured people, is as hugely controversial as any discussion you try to have about giants. Oh, you yeah. immediately you immediately don't know what you're talking about. You're a crazy person if you try to initiate a discussion about either one of those subjects all over the world, including New Zealand. In New Zealand, it's hugely controversial to try to um, present evidence that has anything to do with small statured people. But everywhere you go around the world where you encounter this symbolic tradition that I've been pursuing, you also encounter reports of small statured people. So it looks to me as if on Orkney what the Vikings stumbled on were the mythical Nomo, the Nema, the small statured teachers of the Dogen, along with the Dogen clerics who were average-sized black Africans. And that all happened maybe 200 years before the appearance of dynastic Egypt. As a matter of fact, by... 3000 BC, you have suddenly against a backdrop of no history, you 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 have agriculturally based kingships appear in four locations at the same moment in history. One was in Egypt, referred to as Taru. One in China, referred to as Iru. One, my guess is in Ireland, referred to as Aru. And another one in South America referred to as Peru. Now, those terms in the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic language are based on roots, root words that refer to the four cardinal points of the globe, which is roughly where those are situated. But the full terms, the full names of the the four locations also represent four stages of an agricultural cycle. The first one represents um, an uncultivated field. The second one, a field that's been planted. The third one, a field that has crops growing in it. And the fourth one, a granary where where harvested grain is stored. The word peru in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language actually refers to the keepers of those granaries. So, it seems feasible to me, it seems uh, sensible to me that having received instruction at 3200 B.C. on Orkney in agriculture and in all the the usual civilizing skills that we see exhibited everywhere, including stone masonry on a megalithic scale, that 200 years later you have these civilizations pop up, you know, all with the same symbols. You know, it's a form of a lion in every case, except uh, in Peru they didn't have lions, so it's a puma. But you have uh-huh. lions in China, lions in Egypt, lions in Ireland. And I, the lion is a symbol of Ireland. Uh, commonalities like that, not because 
the groups were necessarily in contact with each other, but because they had all received instruction from the same teachers about the same symbolic system. That's fascinating. And was was um, Orkney the only place where where this kind of instruction took place, or does it go back to go back to Tepe too? Um, go back to Tepe looks like it was the first round. Okay, now the Egyptians talk about a first time, and the Buddhists okay. talk about the first time knowledge was passed to humanity from a Buddha. The Dogen talk about a time when humanity was restored to culture. But ah. but you don't talk about a first time if there wasn't more than one time. You just call it the time. Yeah. So the implication is there was more than one time. And it looks to me as if there was instruction that occurred at 9000 B.C. in the Fertile Crescent region and a second era of instruction that happened around 3200 B.C. on Orkney. There may have been other localities. I don't don't have any toehold at any other sites where that might have happened or any other eras where that might have happened, but there could have been more. Um, but I, I see direct evidence. Um, it looks to me as if the part of the reason ancient Egypt is so complicated to understand is because it looks to me as if we had immediate contact from Fertile Crescent region to Egypt at 10,000 B.C. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Robert Boval's um, Orion correlation theory. He says that the three large pyramids at Giza were meant to represent the three belt stars of Orion uh-huh. and the constellation of Orion. And there are very good, excellent reasons to think that that's right. The Dogen provide a rationale. I mean, Boval says it's true, but he doesn't give us a reason why they would have done that. The Dogen provide us with the sensible reason why they did it. Um, even down to what the Dogen are saying that, um, okay, you, you're familiar with the Hermetic um, saying, as above, so below. Oh, that absolutely. Implies, yeah. It implies that the processes that we see in the universe are in some way fundamentally similar to the processes that are in the microcosm where atoms are formed. Uh-huh. Well, the Dogen are saying, the Dogen do a careful job of describing a fundamental structure of matter that is a spiral that exists at every point in space and time. And they say that the reason they themselves place large stones on a plateau to represent stars, including the belt stars of Orion, they say the reason they're pointing to the belt stars of Orion is because they want to draw our attention to a structure called the chariot of Orion, which they say is a direct counterpart to that spiral of matter, that if we just look at this spiral in the in the heavens, we can learn all sorts of things we don't know about how the spiral of matter works. The problem is, there's no spiral up there. <laughs> Until, well, okay, I, I knew, it, it, it's a, 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 a complicated chain of events. Basically, the Dogen have a myth that uh, talks about how a character who represents light measures out the universe. And uh, he measures it out in cubits. And, but the Egyptian word for a cubit was a compound word it, that literally means light measure. It's akume, and it means uh-huh. light measure. So I thought someone is trying to set up correlation here, a symbolic relationship between a cubit measured with your arm, your forearm, and a, cu- and a light year as a measure of distance in the universe. So I asked myself, how do, we, how do we know how big a cubit was in Egypt? Well, the way we know it is somebody inferred the size of a cubit from the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. They, they figured out what the constant, uh, the common factor was of all the dimensions, and that was a cubit. The Great Pyramid measures 440 cubits per side of the square base and 280 cubits high. So, Mm -hmm. again, working with very little information, I went to Google and I typed in Orion because above all things the pyramids reflect Orion. I keyed in 440 and 280 and the word Orion and I pressed enter and it turned up references to 
a spiraling birthplace of stars that you can't see because the light's too faint. It's called Barnard's Loop, and it centers on the belt stars of Orion. It's right where the Dogen said it was, and when you image it with time-lapse photography, it looks for all the world as if it's the wheel of a chariot that Orion the Hunter is standing in. So their term, Chariot of Orion, is a correct term also. Wow. Well, you know, in in Ireland, are you you're familiar with Newgrange? <clears throat> yes, I am. Uh, yep. They they use they they've got spirals all over the place and and they can't just be decorative. They have to mean something. They have right, to Right, they do. You know, it it's kind of like it's not it's not just a a pretty pat, you know, I had nothing better to do so I drew a spiral. It it has to be a message that they're trying to leave to 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 the future and and we're too dumb to figure it out. Well, I, I can I can bring that into context for you. All all okay. of the traditions that I'm researching rest on a philosophy of creation that's very old. In India it's called Samkhya. It was a companion to yoga. Yoga uh-huh. is the personal expression of all the same concepts that Samkhya expresses in terms of universes and and the structure of matter and so forth. Uh-huh. Now, Samkhya says that universe, and the Dogen agree with this, that universes form in pairs, a non-material and a material universe. As a, That's the normal form, just like uh, one of the normal forms of stars may be binary star systems, where there are two okay. stars, not one. Universes, uh-huh. they say, form in pairs. And there is a cycle of energy that scrolls between the two universes that is as essential to life in the universe as the natural water cycle is on Earth. The natural water cycle is you know, the, the cycle where water from the ocean evaporates to form clouds and then rise up over the mountains and create rain, and the rain falls in streams that flow back to the ocean. Without that cycle of water, we wouldn't have any life on Earth. Well, the Dogen are saying that without the cycle of energy between the two universes, you wouldn't have any life in the universe. Now, the way that that energy flows is by way of two spirals, one on the non-material side and one on the material side, that function the same way that a Taurus scroll does. It, you know, the way you move, you move parchment progressively from one spindle to the other spindle of the scroll that mm-hmm. is symbolic of how that energy flows. In Kabbalism, that concept is specifically symbolic of the flow of energy between two universes. So at Newgrange, my my best guess is that the double spiral is representing that same cycle of of energy. There have been some glyphs that have been found in, in uh the United States that that you know they can't of course date rock but they have the spirals in it as well so it's a symbol that that um, if not consciously subconsciously or through DNA or whatever um, that that symbol has been utilized to mean something even if they didn't know what it was right and that can happen really only two ways well three ways but the most likely ways are either they were drawing something they could see that we can't see. Uh-huh. That perhaps there were structures in the sky they could see that looked like that, and so they were copying them down. The other possibility is they were all representing the same concept. And the idea that there are eras of instruction that teach that very concept, it says to me that we may have had people in earlier epochs of time who were had benefited from the same instruction who were, instruction who were trying to represent that. Well, you know, one of the things that that I have always um been been disturbed is that that when when the Europeans came to to this continent, they assumed the Indians were primitive and so they tried to, you know, to educate them into Christianity and they 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 eradicated their own spiritual belief system, which probably was was a heck of a lot better than what Christianity had to offer. 
And right. and it it feels to me, uh, you know, because we were invaders. This was, you know, for, forget pilgrims and that. We were invading this country and not and not respecting the indigenous people at all. So so what we've got is is I think fascinating. We've got cultures that that and societies that that normally we would have said, ah, oh, they're primitive, they can't possibly know about spirituality, and it appears that they knew a lot more than than the Bible actually gives us, because the Bible gives us stories that that that, that really don't explain creation the way that these cultures explain it, which makes far more sense. Right. And we can demonstrate connections to the Native American tribes to the same tradition I'm talking about. There's some easy ways to, even without knowing all the details of any given culture, there are ways of intuitively understanding that they're connected. Um, one is through a, a set of four structures. There are four structures in Siberia or Mongolia that are related. They're all forms of yurts. I'm sure you're familiar with what a yurt is. But yep, the, no bathroom. The, uh, <laughs> the um, largest form of a yurt is a structural and symbolic match for a Navajo roundhouse. And the least the the I could say can say the the least substantive form of a yurt is called a teepee and it takes the same structural form and symbolic form as a Native American teepee, a traditional teepee. It's made with um this is these are Symbolically, these are forms of Buddhist stupas, and I was concerned. I was in- interested because with a teepee, a teepee is a round, creates a round um, structure. I thought, I know a, a stupa is supposed to be aligned to the cardinal points. How do you align a round structure? Turns out you don't. You align the four poles that you're using as the framework for the teepee, and then you put the the hides around it to create the round structure. Mm-hmm. Um, you have similar connections, uh, many connections between the Dogon and the Hopi Indians. I don't know if you know who Gary David is. He's a researcher who has done a lot of work with the Hopi Indians, and he and I are in yeah. contact fairly frequently about things that are in common between the Dogon, the way the Dogon do things, and the way that the Hopi do things. Uh, the Cherokee Indians have associations also through their language, through connections to short statured people, um, through um, architectural and uh, symbolic forms that they used. Unfortunately, a lot of this stuff was was wiped out by the Europeans who, who came, as you said. I mean, there were apparently quite extensive cities in North America that were Native American cities um, that took, you know, they utilized pyramid-type um, shapes, uh, structures, um, had a lot of things in common with some of the old world classic religious traditions, um, but the settlers in America didn't want to hear about that. They were more interested in in <laughs> progressing across the land and taking taking charge of the land, not in preserving anything that had been there before. Yeah, well, the, the Anastasi in Chaco Canyon, um, a lot of their structures are circular too. Right. Now, what's interesting is because of the way – these symbolic reversals work, I can say with confidence that any cosmologically based structure that has a round base is archaic. It comes from the first half of the 12,000 year cycle. And any structure that has a square base is more anciently recent. It comes from the second half. So I look at the Egyptian pyramids at Giza, which have square bases, uh-huh. And I can I can say I can't say absolutely that they were built during this cycle. My friend John Anthony West thought they might have been built in a, either the last cycle back or maybe even two cycles back. But I can say with certainty they were built during the second half of whatever cycle they were built in, because the uh-huh. symbolism works that way. Wow. And that would be a time. In a matriarch, that would be a matriarchal society then. Well, no. If it with a square base, it's patriarchal. And yeah, if it has a round it's a, base. It's, now the the Dogen have a shrine that is, as I said, is a very close match for a Buddhist stupa shrine. As a matter of fact, um, 
there had been a controversy for about 10 years, um, maybe longer than that, about the Dogen. Um, my studies are based on an anthropological study that was conducted over 30 years of the Dogen by some French, very famous French anthropologists. Well, the French anthropologists described a very closely held secret tradition that um, the way it worked was that if it's the if I wanted to learn about the tradition, it's my job to ask a priest questions, and the priest gives me answers to my questions. But he first makes sure that the question I'm asking is appropriate to what my he knows my knowledge is about the tradition. So if if I ask a question that's wildly out of range of what my initiated status is, he's required to remain silent or to deny any knowledge of the subject rather than answer my question. So about 30 years after the French anthropologists were studying the Dogen, uh, a Belgian team went in to restudy the tribe. The French people were there for 30 years. The Belgians were only there for a few years. And the Belgians came away saying, look, we can't find any evidence anywhere of this cosmological, the symbolic tradition that the, the French reported, that anyone we talked to denies knowing anything about it. Never mind that the Frenchman documented that that should be the case, that if a stranger comes in from the outside asking questions, the uh -huh. tribes people are going to uniformly tell them we don't know anything about it. I, I compare it to parents who go to parents' weekend at a college and see no evidence of drug or alcohol use. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. because you have a society who are all working in cooperation with each other to make sure that the outsiders never see it. Well, that's very so, much like the uh, the the Masons. You know, right. you you know, it, each level that you go up, there is <clears throat> study and 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 there there is more wisdom that is shared with you the the longer you study them the further up you go on the ladder, so to speak. So the Belgian anthropologist concluded that there was no Dogen cosmology. This was not a legitimate forum that the Dogen priests had just invented answers to the questions to get the French anthropologists off their back, and they just made it up as they went along. And that the shrine that Dogen were talking about was only known, it was a chimera known only to the French anthropologists. It didn't exist. What he missed wow. was... what. What the Belgian missed was that the Dogen Shrine is structurally and symbolically almost a perfect match for a Buddhist stupa and is the grand symbol of a cosmology that's a match for the Buddhist cosmology. So I could see that the Belgian anthropologist could not possibly be right, that it's not reasonable to think that the Dogen priests casually invented Buddhism. No. So I contacted the Belgian and I said, here's, here's a critical piece that got missed here. Your, your interpretation isn't right. I would like to offer to co-report that with you in the academic journal that you edit. I thought, if you're going to contradict a guy's theory, the very least you can do is let him be part of the process. You can take claim credit for, for having discovered that the first theory wasn't right. Yeah. Well, he declined that, so I started looking for other anthropology, anthropological journals to write an article for and ended up writing one. As far as I know, it's the, um, the last word on the subject is that the Dogen cosmology has to be legitimate because you have cultures all across India and Asia, Asia who are observing almost precisely the thing that the, Af the French anthropologist says the African tribe does. Wow. Well, I, I think the Dogans, you know, frankly, were, are so much further ahead of the rest of us in, in many different ways. I love the way that they take care of conflict. Yes, I love that, too. And that also connects to uh, Orkney. Um, you you, and... you want to give it out? Because I think people should hear this. It's just so civilized that it's... Sure. Um, it, yeah. One, every uh, Dogen village includes uh, a meeting house. It's called a toguna, and sometimes described as a men's meeting house, but it's really a community meeting house. 
And the rule in Dogen society is that if a disagreement arises among any any group of people within the village, they are required to go to the meeting house and to stay there until the issue has been resolved to the satisfaction of everybody involved in it. And the meeting house is built to a half height so that you can't even stand up while you're discussing it. You know, it sort of avoids fistfights because you have uh-huh. to sit down um, while you're discussing it. And all inter- interested parties in the village go there and work it out among themselves until they've resolved it. And so your typical Dogen village is a very peaceful place. Well, the same was true on Orkney, that the archaeologists can see that Scarabray was a very peaceful village. It also includes a structure that is visually almost a perfect match for the Dogen Toguna house. So I'm imagining that, I mean, no one knows for sure, but I'm imagining that in Neolithic times, that Scarabray was peaceful for the same reason the Dogen village is peaceful, that they, they worked out their problems as they went. Yeah. Now, you know, if we did that today, we wouldn't need courts or lawyers or anything. That's right. And also, when your expectation is that if you get into a, a disagreement with somebody that you're going to be required to go do that, then you tend to be more careful about what you take issue with. Yeah. You, know, you find <laughs> find ways to talk to people that don't involve getting into an argument with them. I found I found it interesting too, with your with your different languages and your different cultures, that they all had a very similar meaning meaning for taboo. Yes, they do. Um, the Dogen have done a very good job of uh, their language is based on root syllables. Um, you might think of it in terms. Every, I think we all are from, might be familiar with the the syllable nu n u that refers to water or waves in Egypt. The Dogen, the Dogen also understand it to refer to water or waves. These are in English they would be basically two letter syllables. Um, you've got Ra in Egypt, who is the sun god. That's one of those syllables. Um, a whole dictionary full of these uh, is the Dogen Dictionary, basically. And those root syllables can be, they're associated with a concept, and the syllables can be mixed and matched together to combine concepts to build larger concepts, like building blocks. It turns out the Maori language in New Zealand is built from those same phonetic building blocks. So I realized very early that I could predict the meaning of a Maori word based solely on how it was pronounced. Same is true with ancient Egyptian words. If I know how the word was pronounced, I can give you uh, an interpretation of what it probably means. So language uh, is is very important to um, to try and to sort all that out. I'm trying to get back to now what your original question was about language. Um, taboo. Oh, taboo, right. Uh, the Dogen have a concept of tapu. Uh, the Dogen and the Maori have... Uh, the idea is even, even ancient uh, Judaism had concepts of taboo, and, and uh, the idea is that there are certain actions that a person can take that we were talking about uh, the Belgian anthropologist coming in and asking questions that weren't appropriate to his standing as as an initiate. There are certain actions at certain places you can go that are only appropriate to a priest. And if a person who is not a priest ends up taking that action or going to that place, they create an impurity that has to be resolved. And that's what taboo or tapu originally referred to is a priest is capable of clearing that that impurity but there are certain ritual actions they have to take, certain prayers they have to recite, and certain um, maybe certain remedial actions the the person who created the transgression has to go through to try to clear that um, that taboo. In in modern Judaism, you have remnants of that um, when there's a Jewish funeral when people attend the funeral in the Jewish cemetery and they return to the ha- um, the home of the family afterwards for. Um, usually for a meal and and to comfort the family, um, they're required to wash, or they traditionally wash their hands before they go into the house. Having left the cemetery, they're required to ritually wash their hands before they, they step back into everyday life. Um, and that I see that as um, an example of a, of a, a taboo that is carried over from ancient times. 
Um, the Maori have many of them, and the Dogen have some of them, and you can see evidence of it in, in the other cultures where um, look, looking for the transgressions the person might commit. You know, how, how, what has he done that, um, you know, being around the dead is one of those those um, transgressions that only certain people were allowed to work with the dead body. Uh, even in modern American society, we have, you know, undertakers who do that for us. Your, your average person does not try to try to dress the the body of their own family member who dies. We have a class of no. of workers who do that. Yeah, it's it's really it's it's fascinating how the symbols in the different cultures um, really tell you the meaning of what's going on. I think what I loved the most was that the the creation was an embrace, which I found damn near poetic. And, yeah. and especially at Goblekwe Tepe, where, where you have the hands hugging, hugging the pillar. Uh-huh. There, um, I was struggling to understand what those, okay, on one of the pillars at Gobekli Tepe, you have carved um, arms coming down. They sort of emerge from the side of the pillar and come down the length of the pillar, and at, as they reach uh, the midpoint of the pillar, they turn into hands that wrap around the end of the the narrow pillar, uh, with uh-huh. the fingers sort of touching at on the narrow side of the pillar. Um, I was trying to understand what that represented, and I, I hadn't really su- succeeded very well at it until um, several years ago. One morning, I thought I was researching um, questions about language for a, ha- a half a dozen different questions for friends of mine who had had sent me inquiries about, can you give me an interpretation about what this means? And so I was researching all these six questions, and this one morning, they all resolved in about a 10-minute period of time based on words that fell in the same column of the same page of the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary. And the seventh word that was on that same page was an Egyptian word that means embrace, but it can also mean pillar. Ah. And it occurred to me that even though whoever had done the artwork, the carving work on the Gobekli Tepe pillar, seems to have had no experience with artistic aesthetic, this is not a soft, warm embrace this picture. This is, it looks like a cold gripping of the pillar. They didn't. They haven't done a good job of of rendering. What, what we would interpret as being a warm, familial embrace. But I started exploring Egyptian words for embrace and realized that there are many of them, and every one is a homonym for a key cosmological term. So the concept of an embrace is a very important one that I needed to get to the bottom of. But from that point on, I realized that what I was looking at on that very earliest pillar at Gobekli Tepe was supposed to be the depiction of an embrace, which is... The relation, one of the ways, uh, one of the metaphors used to describe the relationship between the non-material and the material universes. Um, I mean, it just uh, it blows my it blows my mind. You know, you a majority of the people that you rub elbows with every day doesn't even think of of, of these kind of concepts, and 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 you're going back thousands of years here with primitive people, primitive in quotes, people who had a greater understanding of spirit, of material and non-material, of above, so below, of, of all of these concepts that, that people are, are now, now discovering and think they're discovering something new, and it's been around since the beginning of time. That's right, been around for a very long time, as far back as we can trace with any real evidence, you know, and it, and it doesn't really go back very far before it, we're having to get creative about how to even find the evidence. Well, yeah, that, that's that's you know my next thing is this something that was taught in these schools? I mean, is this is this where people had the awakening to be able to to um, conceptualize? 
non-material becoming material becoming human. Right. And from my perspective, yes, this is a deliberately instructed tradition. Someone put a lot of effort into formulating how how it would be taught. Um, I have a book at the publisher right now that will be out probably in early 2020. Um, my working title for it is The Plan of the Ancient Cosmology, and it's an opportunity for me to talk about precisely that, how um, whoever put the symbolic system together, the kinds of, of choices they made for how they were going to represent ideas in a way that had a hope of surviving thousands of years of transmission down from one person, one generation to another generation. Well, what um, I love is they haven't really, it, it appears that they were not given the names of gods or even God. They they talked energy, they talked consciousness, they talked spiritual, material, material and non-material, but nowhere in here is, you know, you know, Thousands of years later, we have the Greek and Roman gods and the Norse gods, and and you know everybody has a god, but right. but it, it 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 feels as though the, the 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 creation itself had nothing to do with something that needed to be worshipped, and, and right. yet of course the so don't as don't, human, don't, don't even you know. say worship; they say celebrate, or they okay. say praise. But okay. where the, where the Dogen have stages of creation that are that look for all the world as if they're scientific, the ancient Egyptians have deities. Now, yeah. at some point, and actually, I, I even know at, I can point to a, to the place where it happens. But at some point in the history, concepts become anthropomorphized because it's a way of another way of explaining things. There are certain processes, okay, an individual concept you can represent with a picture very often. Mm-hmm. But a process that's more complicated than that, it's hard to represent in just a picture, it's, um, especially when it comes to things like dynamics of how energy behaves and things like that. You can't really explain it with just a picture or a symbol or a carved symbol. And so it's easier if you can take those concepts and anthropomorphize them, make them into characters, and let the characters do what the energy does. And then you can write a little story about it and say, Ama and Ogo do such and such in the Dogen tradition. And those actions, you can then come back and compare to what energy does, and you realize you've got a match, and that the names of the characters even tell you what the concepts were they represented. Yeah, but unfortunately, so, uh, unfortunately people lost the concept and just worshipped or celebrated the people. Right. And thought, I mean, it went through a, through a series of stages. It starts out at Gobekli Tepe as what I call icons. These are just um, images and objects and symbols that represent a, a concept, but they're all onesies. You know, there's no attempt to try to really... No, no system of writing, no system of putting them together that's obvious. Then it reaches a point where the animals that are pe- de- depicted in the carvings that go back to Tepe, the animals themselves become the symbols. Uh-huh. They become avatars for concepts. And then after a little while, you have, as in ancient Egypt, you have animal-headed deities where the head of the that God tells you something symbolically about what the God's role was the same way that the animal avatar would tell you that. Or you have a Ganesha in India where he's he's an animal head of God. He has an elephant's head and the body of a person, but he also has an animal avatar who is a mouse or a shrew mouse or a rat. And then by the time you get to the ancient Greeks, you've eliminated most of the animal stuff, although... Um, Athena had spider symbolism associated with her. So you haven't lost it entirely, but you have now the deities have become people or in the form of people and myths that started out as scientific descriptions morph into popular literature and soap operas, basically. By the by the time you get to Greek and Roman times, many times the myth is just a soap opera. Yeah. And it started out so pure. Yes, it's very hard 
to keep it straight over a long period of time, which is why I have such enormous respect for any culture that did manage to keep pieces of it straight. And the Buddhists have done that, and the Dogen have done it, and there are a handful of other cultures that seem to have managed to, to keep it straight. One of the really interesting things is that because the Dogen and the Buddhist traditions are so similar in what they represent and how they understand things. I mean, they use entirely different languages, which means they neither one of them got it from the other one. They preserved it independently of each other. And both traditions were documented in ancient times, so we know they're both ancient traditions. It looks like we have two separate traditions that kept all of the pertinent details straight for thousands of years down to the modern, modern day. And because they both kept it straight we can demonstrate that neither one of them distorted much because had they distorted very much, it wouldn't match in the modern day. If one of them had uh-huh. gone off story, then you know we get down to the modern times and a modern authority on Buddhism wouldn't understand things the same way a modern authority on uh, Dogen religion does. So well, when when the Dogen say that... Okay, the Buddhists flatly say that their most sacred symbols were given to humanity by a non-human source. The Dogen say it was a non-human source, but the Dogen go another step and say that non-human source was originally non-material. Uh-huh. Now, because they keep these two long, complicated symbolic systems straight for so many thousands of years, you get down to that last detail and a researcher like myself only has a couple of options. I can say, well, they kept all the other details straight, but somehow they both misremembered in the same way <laughs> who they got it from. Or the other way I can go on it is to say they kept that last detail straight, which means I've got to allow the possibility of a non-human source. Yeah, and you know what I like is, I, I I like the idea that you you know you use the term non-human instead of a, you know alien, um, be, because I I think it's more accurate and it's more appropriate, and mm-hmm. so so the the teachers and the clerics um, that were at in at Orkney they disappeared suddenly. Is there any? I mean, were they were they the non-material form made material for that short period of time? Well, and this that, comes comes down to concepts of the yuga cycle in Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay, the yuga cycle, if you're familiar with it, is the idea that over the passing of ages, humanity goes through a cycle where during some periods they're um, more intimately connected to the things non-material. And in other mm-hmm. eras, they're less connected. And so during there's a what's called a descending half cycle that lasts 12,000 years and an ascending half cycle that's 12,000 years for about a, t- a total of about 25,000 years cycle. And it goes along with something called precession of the equinoxes where the constellations seem to rotate around us. Well, there are sensible reasons why that yuga cycle happens. And one of the things I get to in the same book that talks about circumcision, this is a book I published last year, I self-published it, it's called Seeking the Primordial. Uh-huh. There are There is a sensible scientific perspective based on the outlook of, their, of universes forming in pairs and there being the cycle of energy between universes. What's What's scrolling between the universes isn't just energy, it's also mass. Now, Einstein says when a thing becomes more massive, its time frame slows down. Um, well, we just, is, passed, we, we just passed the ending of the progression, or the beginning of the progression right, of we, the equinoxes. Well, Yes, and we and apparently from my based on my sources we just passed the most material stage, uh, the, the furthest removed from non-material things that we are in the cycle, and that uh-huh. we're now beginning to ascend back up, 
where progressively we're going to become more and more connected to things non-material for the next 12,000 years. So it, it looks like the it's, idea it's is that the, the, the fundamental difference between these universes is a difference in time frame that works. Uh -huh. how, it's basically how fast time runs, how quickly events happen. And that in a period like now where events are running extremely slow relatively for us compared to the non-material, that we can't, we have no perception of them. But when you get to the middle of the cycle, which would be the equinox of, the, of a great year, uh -huh. the time frames theoretically equalize. And when they equalize, then it becomes thinkable that someone who's in one universe could move across to the other one, like through an airlock. Yeah. And that the time frames work a little like pressure does, water pressure or pressure in outer space. If you're in a, sp a pressurized space capsule, you can't just step out into space. You, you would get the difference in pressure would blow you out forcefully. You need oh, an yeah. airlock that you can go into, and then you equalize the pressure of the airlock to what things are outside, and then you can safely step out. Well, the idea is with the universe is that time works the same way, that at at the equinox of the the shifting of the time frames where the time frames equalize, at that point it becomes thinkable that a non material entity could step into the material frame and take action the way the Dogen say they did. So so there there is then no real explanation for why um Scarabray was deserted suddenly. Actually I do have some explanations. Um the symbolism they left behind when they buried over the site says they left under duress. Um, ah. But it was a very interesting kind of duress because they had the time to consider what would happen to their domesticated farm animals. They didn't want to leave them there to starve. And so they had a final feast before they left where they slaughtered 400-some animals and oh, must have fed 1,000 people and um, left these symbolic messages behind before they covered over the site that, that explains that they, they left because they had to leave. But as I said, because of the timing, you can see that it was not something so urgent like there were invaders on their border who were about to kill them all. They had the luxury of time to think about what they were doing and to leave in an orderly fashion, to take the time to bury over the site, to take the time to consider what to do about their farm animals and so forth. So they left under duress. Um, there are other events that happen about the same time that are too complicated to really get into, but it makes it look as if they had um, the shifting time frames were creating problems for them, their their connection. They, their, a lot of their protection of the, the teachers who were there had to do with their connection to non-materiality. And as the time frames continued to shift as the hundreds of you know the centuries passed it looks like that connection got to a point where they they couldn't sustain it anymore they didn't have um the kind of protection they'd had previously and now they were subject to being attacked where previously they hadn't been and so at that point they dispersed and some of them went south into the united kingdom and some of them went um to the americas and some of them went to Polynesia, and some of them went, went to the Arctic, uh, to Greenland, places like that. There, I can see signs of them disperse, dispersing out in many different directions, and that may be where people like the Olmec came from, or uh, the Olmec, Olmec may have been one of the groups that were instructed in the tradition um, and then moved back to where they had been before they were instructed. Um, they're a really interesting connections to the Mediterranean that um, that show a lot of the, the same stuff. The Dogen say that after a period of time, their teachers either chose to left to leave or were forced to leave. Huh. Um, in Ireland, there are myths about the short statured people being forced out of Ireland, and there are two perspectives of the myth. In Ireland, one is that those people left by boat across the Western Sea. Another perspective is they left to go to the underworld. In New Zealand, the myth is 
that short-statured people arrived by boat across the Eastern Sea, and an ancient name for New Zealand in the Maori language means first circle of the underworld. So the Maori perspective, the, the New Zealand perspective, upholds both of the the Irish perspectives on what happened. And there are all sorts of other connections that link New Zealand with Ireland. Wow. It, it's fascinating. Um, you kind of want to go on and on, but I just noticed we're almost out of time. Um, <laughs> uh, this has gone very fast. Um, is, where can people get your books? Uh, Amazon for sure. Is right, the books are available else? pretty much all the usual outlets. The publisher is Inner Traditions, so they have a website, innertraditions.com. There's also an author page for me uh, with their parent company, which is um, Simon & Schuster, so simonandschuster.com. Okay. Um, any of the Amazon outlets have it. You can walk into a Barnes & Noble store and probably find uh, one or more of my books on the bookshelf, and you can certainly order any of the books. Right now there are uh, nine books um, there'll be another two um, probably this year, within the next year. I have a book on Ganesha that I'm going to self-publish in the next few months, and then the book that's at the publisher that will be out early in 2000 or in 2020 um, about the plan of the cosmology. Wow. Uh, now, do you, do you have a website? Uh, there is a LairdScranton.com website, but it was a, a fan site, and I don't really have a connection to it, and it hasn't been maintained very well, so... Um, you can't really reach me through it. Uh, best place to find me is probably on Facebook, uh-huh. and I'm the only Laird Scranton on Facebook. Um, <laughs> is there is there a public appearance that you're going to be doing shortly? Um, I'll I'll be appearing at LeakCon L E A K C O N in Denver, Colorado, the weekend of May 17th. Um, that's the the main uh, conference appearance I have scheduled this year, but um, it changes from year to year. Uh, we've, I've spoken to the ARE, the Edgar Casey Foundation down in Virginia Beach, a number of occasions. I speak to Mainline MUFON in Philadelphia. Um, I've spoken to a MUFON group in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, get to California every so often for conferences out there. I've been to Sedona, Arizona. And I try to post... Um, announcements on my Facebook page before these things happen. Um, Occasionally, I even put on my own day of instruction. Last year, we did a a day of instruction at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, um, for whoever wanted to try to uh, put a day together that is affordable, you know, very low cost, because it's just sort of a straight line to a a one-day-long conference in some kind of a central location that's easy for people to get to by train or car or whatever. Well, wow, you've you've been so informative tonight. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your taking the time. And um, while while this material may look difficult, it's not. And the more comfortable no, you get with it, the more you the more you go, oh wow, look at that. Right. Um, and whoever put it together was very particular about being consistent. They were sticklers for consistency. So. Once you understand a certain piece of it as a pattern, then you can apply that pattern again and again and again. It makes it easy to learn and remember things. Well, I would imagine that after 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 getting through one book, the ne- the next one becomes easier and easier and easier. So that so that somebody has eight or nine books they can read and and really um, learn a lot more about spirituality than than one would expect. Um, I'm just just down to the last few seconds here. I want to thank you so much. You've been so fabulous, and, and hopefully I can get you back on again, and, and we'll plow into you know a couple more of your other books. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's been a fun conversation, and I'd be happy to come back anytime. Fantastic. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, Mark has a show on Wednesday, I believe, with... Um, Maria Wheatley, and uh, again, another fabulous show. Maria Wheatley is a cool lady. Researcher, yeah.